I couldn't see you for the wall What was that you said? What was that you said before you called? And when I couldn't catch you for the fall What was that you said? What was that you said? Nothing hurts this much But I've seen the way That bodies lock And bodies tend to break Institute live stream. I mean, really, every live stream that we do is special, but this one may be a little bit more than the others. Today is March 14th, and that means one thing. Pi Day 3.14. I've got my Pi Day shirt on here. We'll let that breathe for a minute so everybody can read that beautiful text. On Pi Day, we celebrate math, of course. And as the Geotechnical Engineering Society of the United States, we have to celebrate math in geotechnical and civil engineering. So I've said a lot already, but my name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and we are thrilled to have you with us today to mark this festive day. This is, I believe, the ninth time we've done Pi Day with the Geo Institute and the second that we've done it via live stream. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, I, I mean, you're not going to learn that much about it today, so I apologize. But what you can do is go over to geoinstitute.org, and there you'll find out that we're a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And if you like what you see today, and usually I guarantee it, Today, I feel like there's absolutely no doubt you're going to enjoy this one. It's Pi Day, people. Click like, subscribe, and get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. We talk about Pi on Pi Day. P-I, P-I-E. I, I don't know if there's another way to spell Pi, but if there were, I guess the old English maybe would be P-Y-E. We would talk about that, too, if we could, if we felt uh, authoritative enough. So we've brought in an expert somebody who knows math, somebody who knows Pi, and a Geo Institute member that we all know and love. From his home in Colorado, it is Eric Jensen from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and he is going to give us 
a presentation. I think we'll just leave it at that today uh, about a couple of those things that we mentioned earlier. After that, Eric and I are going to have a little pie discussion. I'll ask a few questions. We'll wrap up and you guys will be out of here and back on to whatever boring work you were doing before you joined this live stream today. So Eric, let's go. What do you got? All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Brad. I'm very excited to be here on this, the most auspicious of days. One of my favorite days of the year for I love both pie and pie. Um, okay, let me uh, let me go ahead and get started here. Share my screen. Oh, nope. All right. Well, as a uh, as Brad alluded to, there's a couple different ways we can think about pi, 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 pie, and what I'm here to talk to you about today is what's good. You know, if you're gonna do some calculating or you're gonna do some eating, what I have for you is a definitive-ish guide to what I consider good in this field. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there are tons of different types of pies, and there's a lot of different ways that you can approximate pie. So which one? Which one should you eat? Which ones should you use? I'm here to help you answer that question. Now, as Brad alluded to, this is, of course, the GI. This is the G this is the, the Society for Geotechnical Engineering here in the United States. So why, why should we care about pie and also pie? Well, I mean, pie comes up all the time in geotechnical engineering. I got three examples right here. Anytime you're calculating cross-sectional areas like you might in a triaxial test to find the initial cross-section of the of your specimen, um, you're going to need pi, pi r squared, pi d, all the different um, all the different equations related to circumference and areas of circles. Anytime you you, uh, you um, are doing pipe calculations, a drain of some sort, anytime there's a circle involved, usually you're going to have to bust out pi and a sum approximation of pi to figure out, you know, what what it is uh, exactly you need to calculate. You have slope stability. Um, you know, there right up there in the in the top right corner, we have um, we have a, 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 a um, cylindrical slip surface. That's another circle. You're gonna you're gonna need pi to do that calculation. And then for my personal field, continuum mechanics, computational mechanics, my beloved pi plane, pi plane being the plane where you can where you can uh, discover things about the about the the the, uh, the the strength model you're using, how shear um, how shear is manifested within the principal stresses, very interesting stuff. Stuff where you can find the differences in triaxial content, uh, uh, compression and extension, all sorts of cool things, different types of yield surfaces. I love the pie plane; it comes up all the time. Um, so that's the picture on the left. Um, or maybe you know, if you're a geotechnical engineer and you're interested in uh, interested in uh, the granular mechanics of of uh, cherry pie. Um, I don't know why you might would be, but maybe you're maybe you're uh, designing some sort of um, crazy hopper that requires um, looking at how um, how the cherries uh, in a pie filling might flow around one another or something to that effect. I don't know. Um, you know, pie, both pie and pie comes up in geotechnical engineering or could maybe come up in geotechnical engineering sort of all the time. Now, this is cliche. I admit this is cliche, but we're going to stay here for a second. Now, if you go onto Webster's Dictionary and you look up the definition of both pi and pi, um, we're going to return to this later as it relates to PIE, a dessert consisting of a filling, fruit or custard, in a pastry shell, top of the pastry bowl, or a meat dish baked with biscuit or pastry crushed. I think those two definitions are, are critically important. We'll talk about that in a second. But if we look to the look to the right of the screen, we have we have pi, the 16th letter of the Greek alphabet. And um, the symbol that we use to denote the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. This is a very important number in all of mathematics. It's a transcendental number. We'll talk about it in a second. It has a, you have to, um, you have to come up with a, the value rounded to some number of digits because it's impossible to write all of the digits down. Very fascinating number. And um, if you, uh, if you went back into history, you would find that the person who popularized the use of pi as the symbol denoting the ratio of the circumference of the circle was probably Leonard Euler. Yeah, that Euler, the guy who did the beams, the guy who did a bunch of continuum mechanics, very famous in the in the mathematics field and applied mathematics field. Um, yeah, that that Euler um, was not the first time it was used to denote that particular ratio, but uh, Euler almost definitely popularized it. 
by the way, if you're looking for a very, very interesting rabbit hole, um, and uh, particularly as it relates to the um, early, um, early goings of physics and modern mathematics, starting with Leonard Euler's not a bad place to start. So what do we know about pi? Well, we know it's an irrational number. For those of you who haven't taken a math class in a while, and I admit I am one of them, um, it cannot, that means it cannot be expressed as the ratio of two integers. I'm going to show you in a second that you can get kind of close doing exactly that. But, um, but what that means is that its decimal representation never ends. It goes on to infinity with no apparent repeating pattern, or at least no repeating pattern that anyone has ever found. And I promise you, people have been looking for that pattern forever. This, by the way, that it's an irrational number has been proven. Um, usually what mathematicians way smarter than me use is a, a reductio ad absurdum technique in order to do this. I don't even really know what that means, but I do know that it is proven to be an irrational number. You might be asking yourself, what is the current best guess at pi? How many digits do we actually know? Well, this, this, uh, this I found out uh, actually recently changed in 2022. Google um, uh, has calculated pi to 100 trillion digits which is completely insane. We'll have more on that in a second. Um, quick note, we, we, uh, we have done all sorts of tests on the digits of pi to determine if they're statistically random or not. And it seems like they are, um, but it has never actually been formally proven that the digits are normally distributed. Um, so it's a open question in, in um, the high levels of academic uh, mathematics. If you're interested, yeah, give it a shot um, to try and prove that. Pi is also a transcendental number. It cannot be the solution or the root of any equation involving only finite sums, products, powers, integers, that kind of thing. Um, this is why um, you can't square the circle. For those of you who have heard that term, it's essentially trying to find a circle with the same area of that of a of a or find a square with the same area of that of a that of a circle. Um, so the what that means is that this number can never really be pinned down to a specific number. It has no end, right? So you can't use a compass and a straight edge and all sorts of crazy geometry in order to try and calculate pi. It can't be done. This was proven, by the way, by uh, uh, Lindemann and Weisserstrass um, in 1882. Um, but this problem has been noticed uh, since the Greeks in antiquity. By the way, if you're ever kind of wondering what transcendental number actually means, there are some really cool thought experiments you can find on Wikipedia um, looking at this problem from, you know, stuff like Pythagorean's theorem and other things that they found out in antiquity. And, um, and you'll, you can kind of follow the logic and see why this number is so hard to, to, to pin down and, in fact, can't be. Um, a lot of mathematicians have lost many, many years of their life trying to square the circle, Newton included, by the way. Um, think about all the other stuff he could have done instead of sitting around trying to waste his time doing something like that. Already prolific, but could have been more. Okay, so you're sitting at your computer and it's time to do an approximation. It's time to, it's time to calculate something that involves pi. What do you use, right? You probably were told by a professor at some point, you know what, just, just use 3.14. It's gonna be close enough. And honestly, it's pretty close. Um, I wouldn't suggest using just an integer. Um, it's not very accurate. So I, I, what I did, what I've done here is I created a little script just to go through all these various approximations to try and, you know, give a flavor for how accurate these various approximations of pi are um, for your use, you know, as a geotechnical engineer. I wouldn't suggest using three. It has about a 4.5% error rel relative to if you bust open Python and type math.py and hit print, um, what is pop, what, what uh, pops out. Um, there's, by the way, there's a bunch of approximate fractions you can use. You probably know one of them, 22 divided by 7. Um, these are truncated infinite series of nested fractions. It's a whole mess. There's a lot of these. Um, 22 uh, divided by 7 gets you a 3.14 as uh, the accurate digits. Not bad. 0.04% error. Seems reasonable to me for most practical purposes. My favorite of which, though, of these approximate fractions is the one on the next line. Uh, 245,850,922 divided by 78,256,779. This gets you many digits of pi accurately. And in fact, the error relative to what is, uh, what is stored in Python's math library is exactly zero. You get the same number back. So, you know, if you ever want to calculate it yourself, you can use that approximate, that, that approximate fraction, and you're going to get really close. Now, a lot of calculations of pi involve these cra 
crazy infinite series. And the first of these were, uh, were found out in the 16th and 17th centuries by, by, a, by a guy named Leibniz. Although, although, as with a lot of stuff from this time, it was actually discovered by, by a, a, a philosopher in India, Marava, um, in the 14th century, and again, rediscovered by, by someone in Europe in 17th century. Um, I, I'm not actually going to put those equations on the, on the board here. They're, they're not that interesting. What you need to know is that there's, there's some of an, of an infinite series. And, um, and actually, uh, Marava created a specific correction for this to make the convergence even faster as early as the 14th century. Um, and you'll see the math here, or you'll see the results of the math here in a second. So again, I coded these up, wanted to see how they perform. Um, and that's why we're going to look right here. So on the left, we have the original Marava Leibniz series, which is what it's called today. Um, by the way, there are many other versions of this. This is just one of them. This is, I think, the most famous one, or at least in my research. Um, and what this shows is that, you know, just like you did in math class at one point or in an engineering class where you had to use one of those pesky infinite series, like a Taylor series or a Maclaurin series, trying to approximate a function around a, around a point or something like that. One of those things that, that at least I know when I was in school, I kind of squinted at and went, sure, that sounds great. Um, now, at some point, you had to, because we, of course, can't sum to infinity, you have to pick an endpoint. Um, and what your professor probably annoyingly said, and what I say to my students today is, I don't know, what number is big enough? Well, here's what you should do for something like that. Put in a bunch of different numbers and figure out what is big enough. Um, on the left, with the, Mata, uh, the Madhava Leibniz series, you'll see that one term, you get one digit accuracy, about three. Uh, 3.18% error. Um, and as you increase uh, by factors of 10, the number of terms in the infinite series you decide to sum, you get more and more accurate results. In this case, the convergence profile here is nice and linear, um, which is kind of sweet um, and interesting to see, at least in my opinion. If you, uh, if you use the corrected series, the one that's, uh, uh, that's, that's on the right, you'll see that right off the bat, you get a pretty good number. And then you only need 10 terms in order to get a really accurate approximation of pi. Um, and then it has, uh, you only need 100 terms to get, you know, within a point, what is that, 2.12 e to the minus 13% error. But this has, this series has an interesting feature where it actually doesn't converge any further than that. And it doesn't matter how many more terms you add, it sort of always gets you rough with the same answer. And in fact, the, uh, the value that's in math.py is, is a little technically a little bit better. Although I think we can all agree they're all pretty good. Or why not? Why not use brute force to try and figure this out? Um, I think this is an excellent opportunity to introduce the concept of a Monte Carlo simulation. For those of you who know what these are, essentially what you do is you take advantage of the computing power, modern computing power, and randomness to solve all sorts of different types of problems. Um, here's the idea. What you do is you'll see I have a plot here in the middle, and in that plot is a circle of radius one. and um, and if you look really carefully, you see that there's also a square of side length one kind of all around it, although I didn't actually draw it that well. What you do here is you randomly generate a list of points between zero to one, both in X and Y. So you randomly pick points all over this, all over this uh, plot, like the point I have highlighted here. What you then do is you calculate the distance of each point from the origin. Now, what are you actually calculating? Here you're calculating in a cylindrical coordinate system, you're calculating the radius of that point from the origin, right? Well, if that point is inside the circle of radius one, you increase some count, hence the thumbs up. If it's outside, you don't do anything. Now, because we know the relationships between the radius at the radius is this, uh, the radius distance of that circle is the same as the leg, then you can use that in the relative areas, dividing the total count stuff inside the circle divided by the total number of times you generated points, the total number of points you looked at, and what you end up with, if you multiply by four, because you only have a quarter, you end up with an approximate for pi. So um, this is really slow. It's not a particularly efficient way to do this, but it is kind of fun. Um, so here's, an, so here's a, a series of uh, plots here. So this is with 10 points, 100 points, 1,000 points, 10,000 points, all the way up to 100,000 points. And what you can see is, although it's a very slowly converging uh, 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 process here, and also, I think I probably screwed up whether or not it's uh, less than or equal to one, something like that. I don't know. Either way, the point is you can get, you can at least get that back, that 3.14 by doing it like this. It's slow. It's silly. But for those of you teachers out there, this is an awesome way 
to teach Monte Carlo simulations. Um, it's only like 20 lines of code. It's a pretty cool way to, uh, to, to calculate and to use this uh, methodology for all sorts of other engineering problems. Okay, I mentioned that we have a current best approximation and it was done by Google. Here's a plot that I flagrantly stole from a, um, from a, a, a Google blog. Where on the on the very far left side of the plot you see um, you see the uh, well we have the scale of time scale on the bottom with a couple of jumps and on the uh, on the on the y axis here we have some logarithmic um, of accuracy of pi and you can see how over the course of time the number of digits we can calculate has dramatically increased the Egyptians and the Babylonians figured out that you needed to know pi a long time ago they used things like 3.16 and something like that. Archimedes famously bounded pi by uh, um, subscri uh, by uh, taking polygons and inscribing them versus uh, subscribing them around circles. Found a nice bound for it, um, 3.141-ish. Um, Ptolemy, that uh, that 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 fella, um, spent a lot of time thinking about this problem, as most people did in those days if they had nothing else to do. Um, and then you see there's a jump here around uh, in the 13th century um, attributed to Madhava, um, although Google thought to the to, to just say the lead in its series. And you see there's a jump in the number of, the number of uh, digits of pi. And it wasn't until the advent into computers, particularly supercomputing in the 1950s, that we ended up uh, really cranking up how many digits of pi that we have actually got. All the way up to the current best, the current world record is by a, a program called Y Cruncher, made by Google. Um, in order to, to run this code, it took 158 days What's interesting about modern modern algorithms is it's actually not the CPU power that's the most important thing. It's act, it's the storage. Um, so it used 515 terabytes of storage in order to keep this uh, 100, uh, 100 trillion digit uh, bit of pi all figured out. Um, one single compute node, but it did have 128 virtual CPUs. For those of you who are computer people, this will make more sense. Um, and it uses what's called the Chudnovsky algorithm. Um, it looks like this. I don't know. Someone figured it out. Or actually, I believe it was two brothers um, figured this out. And it's a, a very rapidly converging algorithm um, to the point where you can uh, you can calculate pi up to many, 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 many digits very quickly. Um, by the way, if you're interested in that algorithm, you can uh, uh, there's a, a Python implementation on Wikipedia that you can check out and you'll see it works really, really well, um, as you might expect. So, OK, so. Those are a lot of different approximation of pi's, but how much precision is enough here? What do we need? Now, I contend for nearly all practical purposes, of which I include geotechnical engineering, a few digits is probably all you need, right? Um, some scientists once claimed that, you, that you'll need 39 digits to accurately calculate the circumference uh, of, of the universe, I should say universe, pardon me, universe to within one atom. So it's a, you need that many for cosmological calculations. Large numbers are really weird. Small numbers are really weird too. So you need more accuracy, uh, the smaller or larger you get. Um, and that and Arndt uh, further concluded that, you know, a few hundred digits are fine for all calculations, which I personally think is complete overkill. 3.14 is probably gonna work fine for you. Now, you might ask me, why, why do we care? Why keep calculating? Why do we need 100 trillion digits of pi? Well. Honestly, never underestimate the human desire to break records. It's a it's a point of pride for uh, people. But in more practically term, more practical terms, it's an awesome way to test supercomputers. We know the answer. You hey, we have a gold. Well, we know the answer up to 100, 100 trillion digits. We have something to compare against. It's a really nice test um, for the computing power of these things. How fast we can make algorithms work, and it's also a really nice test for a bunch of different types of mathematics. So that's why we care. That's why we still do this. There you go. First, a thousand digits of pi. There are websites out there where you can see a hundred thousand digits, and um, it's a really good exercise in understanding orders of magnitude because it gets out of control pretty quickly. Okay, now that's enough on pi. Let's go back to pie. So I mentioned a dessert consisting of a filling as as of a fruit or custard in a pastry shell or topped with a pastry or both, or a meat dish baked with biscuit or pastry crust. Now I think obviously these definitions are important. But what I really want to highlight here is that I actually think this is highlighting a more a more interesting concept in food categorization and ranking. And how I want to approach this is by thinking about the question that we've all heard before, is a hot dog a sandwich? Now, I can hear you all groaning. Um, this is one of those questions that if, you, if you've asked somebody who's never thought about it before, 
they will um they will inevitably have a visceral reaction to it and they will fall in one of the two camps almost without thinking about it that sort of quick uh, reaction thinking will kick in and they'll say something like obviously it's a sandwich look at it it's a it's a filling inside some bread it's clearly a sandwich or they'll take a look at you and go, what are you talking about? That's absolute insanity. A sandwich looks like the thing on the right. Um, so I get it. This is actually kind of an annoying <laughs> an annoying conversation. And it, you hear stuff like it's bread with some filling. Duh. What's wrong with you? It's clearly only one piece of bread with something in it. Not sure what it is. Definitely not a sandwich. Um, I heard John Hodgman once on the John Hodgman Pons podcast say it can't be sensibly served split in two. Therefore, it violates the primary sandwichness of a sandwich, whatever that means. Um, by the way, if you look up the definition of sandwich, it um, the hot dog very clearly is a sandwich by that definition. So what is this nonsense that it requires more than one slice of bread? You ever heard of a, a sub or a hoagie? These are sandwiches that I grew up with, haven't lived in Connecticut. Um, and, uh, and, and I can promise you, if you ever got one there, they, they, they don't cut the bread all the way through. It looks very much like a hot dog, except it's stuffed with, you know, uh, uh, lunch meats and, and various vegetables. Um, then there's the, the real crazies out there who start getting out of control and start saying things like, guys, the hot dog is, is actually a taco, which I don't know, maybe seems kind of crazy to me, but it's, you know, it certainly looks more like a taco than some sandwiches. So I get it. This is kind of weird. And the answer probably lies somewhere in the arguments about formal definitions versus how we colloquially talk about things. Um, so I don't actually know the answer. I, I tend to lean, if we're going to be honest, a little bit more towards that it is a sandwich, but I can understand arguments either way. But my main point here is that I actually think we're talking about this all wrong. I think this is the wrong way to think about this question. I think that sandwich or some other more generic noun, if you can think of one, is, is actually should be thought of as something higher in what I'm going to now call and stake my claim to the food categorization taxonomic hierarchy. What do I mean by that? I think that sandwich or some other word is actually further up in the hierarchy than are all of these other things. So like, I don't know, is it a family? Is it an order? Is it class? Is it is it a phylum or maybe even kingdom? I have no idea, but I don't think it's a genus or a species. Let's put it that way. So I think that there's some something, I'm going to call it sandwich because the definition actually works pretty well. And then underneath it are all these other genuses of classic sandwiches, hoagies, subs, other different types of bun creations, uh, hot dogs, pork buns, uh, lobster rolls, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. Maybe we can include tacos and other flatbreads. I, I can see the argument against burritos, but I don't know. I, I think that we have to, if we're going to think about this problem, we should think about it much more broadly than is the hot dog a sandwich? And that leads me back to pies, because those two definitions, according to Webster, actually include a truly, truly incredible amount of pies, right? We got sweet fruit pies, your apples, cherries, mixed berries, uh, key lime, anything, anything with those crazy meringue co uh, uh, concoctions, um, you know, lemon meringues and whatnot, uh, even up to like banana creams and those, and those things. I mean, then there's a whole class of of, of, of non-fruit sweet pies, if you want to categorize the genus like that. Things like, um, you know, chocolate pies, buttermilk, pumpkin, uh, pecan, peanut butter, if you're into those sort of things. Then, of course, there's just an absolute crazy amount of different custards and tarts and cheesecakes all over the world um, that definitely fit the definition. And then, and then of course, there's the other, the other definition, all of the savory stuff, right? You got your steaks and ales, your chicken pots, all sorts of crazy curry pies, all of which I personally adore. And then there's the, then there's the sweet and savory versions of these where they're intended to be like put into a, um, you know, put into your hand on a, on a street corner somewhere, um, or uh, put into a lunchbox and serve for later. Your various hand pies, you know, empanadas are very clearly a pie. If you squint at it, maybe, maybe pierogies. I don't know. Maybe that's a little too crazy. They're kind of slippery. But my point here is there's a lot of different types of pies. And then there's, then there's the ones that don't include biscuit or pastry at all, like a shepherd's pie, which is delicious and we should include in this. So my argument here is that pie is actually too broad of a term. And we have to think about pies um, a little bit there differently. But as it relates to Pi Day, um, in the spirit of Pi Day, which uh, was first introduced to me by my, uh, by my high school, one of my high school mathematics teachers, Mr. Goldberg, shout out. Um, he was he was an excellent mathematics teacher and um, and also just as all good high school math teachers are a little crazy for Pi Day, um, 
And so in the spirit of, of the pie day, as it was originally given to me, I'm only going to rank sweet fruit and non-fruit pies, which is a bit of a bummer because I personally love savory pies. I'm all about savory pies. Um, but you know what? They're out here. Um, also, I have, I have to put this disclaimer in here. Um, I love the culinary traditions of the American South. They are wonderful. They're delicious. I grew up in Connecticut, but my grandmother literally was Miss Louisiana. So I have connections to the South. I love the food. Um, but I got to be honest, most of their pies are a little too sweet. And this is coming from someone who loves sweet things. I'll eat the frosting right off of a cake. But from a pie, maybe a little too sweet. So for those of you who uh, are, are members of those culinary traditions, this isn't a shot. It's just that from my taste, a little too sweet. And what I want in pies is a little different. Um, I do make an exception in my top 10 list for buttermilk pie, which is fantastic. And I have one, ex a second exception for Hershey's pie, which is a personal reason we'll get to in a second. Oh, and, and I cheat once or maybe twice in my rankings. Deal with it. Okay. Eric's definitive rankings of top, top 10 pies. Number 10, cherry pie. Cherry pie is often overrated. Or uh, sorry, it's a, a sorry. Excuse me, it's underrated. People uh, people think it stinks, um, and I will agree with you if it's a crappy cherry pie. Um, they, they're like a maraschino bomb. They're not that interesting. I think they're kind of gross. But a really good one that has the proper balance of acidity with the sweetness is delicious. Um, so I put it number ten. Number nine, pumpkin pie, a, a, a classic of the genre for certain, particularly around the Thanksgiving time. My only qualm here is that most times you eat pumpkin pie, you're eating the stuff out of the can, and it's just not that good. If you're going to make a pumpkin pie, make it with pumpkin, please. Um, and those are delicious. Um, number eight, this is my personal a personal add in here. This is the only one that I don't think really belongs in the top 10, but I put it here anyway for personal reasons. Hershey's pie or Oreo pies, it's sometimes called, or um, other different types of uh, chocolate pies. Uh, my wife's grandmother's Hershey pie recipe has become a staple of our Thanksgiving. It's a little gross, but... Uh, I love it nonetheless, and um, can't have Thanksgiving without it. Therefore, I give it number eight. Next two are two different berry pies. I think mixed berries trying too hard, personally. Um, so I prefer them to be simpler. Uh, blackberry pie, which is my favorite berry. Hence, blackberry pie is number six over mixed berry. Number five, key lime pie. Um, first to note, key lime pies are fantastic. And if you've never had one that was made actually out of key limes, um, the, the uh, little limes from, uh, from the Florida Keys, they are absolutely delicious, and they're not nearly as tart as some of the ones that you've you've tried before, probably. Um, by the way, I uh, I don't I don't consider key lime pie to be a southern pie because everything south of Miami is not the American South. Um, buttermilk pie, these are absolutely fantastic. If you've never had a buttermilk pie, these are truly delicious. Again, it has that good balance. The buttermilk adds a little acidity, um, which makes it not quite as sweet. Um, my favorite stone fruit pie is peach pie, which is why it comes in at number three. Um, by the way, I can see an argument for why this this actually might be a southern pie, considering Georgia and the uh, Georgia peaches. Um, but there are other places in the country, including Palisade, Colorado, that uh, makes fantastic peaches or grows fantastic peaches and makes great peach pie. So, uh, but I'll accept your argument if you want to make it an argument. Okay, I, I cheat here. Uh, chicken pot pie goes in at number three for real. Um, it is the best of the savory pies, in my opinion. It's a classic of the genre, um, at least here in the states. It's delicious. Um, and then I put my, my second favorite pie, a New York style cheesecake, um, which is my maybe my other cheat. Um, cheesecake, uh, particularly from New York, if you've never had a slice, is one of the one of the great experiences of your life. Um, fly to LaGuardia right now if you haven't had one. Um, I understand cheesecake. Some bad cheesecake is really really terrible, but New York style cheesecake from uh, from a you know from places in New York that do it well um, is so much better uh, that it is a uh, it has to come in at number two for me. Great experience, but I'm not going to overthink this, guys. The best pie in the world, it's an, and it's not even close, is the apple pie. Um, apple pie is an American institution, and it also tastes delicious. Um, uh, in my opinion, if it's good enough for uh, Stifler and the gang, it's good enough for Don McLean, it's good enough for uh, Thank You for Smoking, it's good enough for me. I think it's fantastic, and I'll put it up against any other pie. Um, so thanks, and I'm, in, I'm also sorry. So typically, a lot of our live streams have technical content, and we kind of choose our speaker based on the topic, right? A few times a year, we do something like this. We do Terzaghi Day, and I just have to choose somebody who's going to do the presentation. 
And so I think to myself sometimes, did I pick the right person to <laughs> to do this to do this talk on on this I don't day? Know if you did. <laughs> Eric, you got to about slide three, and mm -hmm. I was like, I, I can't believe that I nailed this one. I mean, we had <laughs> well, it I all. Appreciate it. You went. You got patriotic there at the end. You did the pie ranking. I mean, we got statistics is the mathematical discipline that's nearest and dearest to my heart. We got an Euler shout out. I oh, mean, yeah. come on. This was unbelievable today. I think so. So, yes, we definitely picked the right person today. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions here, and then I'm going to talk about a few pies. And I didn't rank mine because I felt like that was too controversial. And we're going to start out by going back to math here. And right. uh, who, who do you have a favorite mathematician of all time? Is there somebody that oh, you feel a kindred man. spirit with? That's you know, that's a really good question. And uh, and honestly, it probably just changes depending on whose Wikipedia page I read most recently. Um, all of the all of the great. Um, for example, going back to Leonard Euler, I I discovered that. Um, Bernoulli, yeah, that Bernoulli, um, the one with the famous equation, um, was a tutor of Euler's. Honestly, at that at that time in Europe, they were, um, well, those you know, those centuries in Europe, all these people interacted with each other. So it's it's sort of hard to to um, to you know pick one or the other because um, they were all influencing each other. But I mean, it's hard. I mean, the OG, I mean, Newton, come on, <laughs> does it get better than that? <laughs> so then the follow up to that is. Every time I would organize a Pi Day thing, there would be this contingent of people who would say, "Why don't we celebrate any other constants?" Do you have a what, Do you like, have a favorite what, uh, math? Like, you mean You mean You mean like Euler's number? <laughs> um, That's a good one. Do you have a the, favorite the, mathematical the, 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 constant? Uh, base of the base of the natural logarithm. Um, that one's probably my favorite, actually. Um, going back, to, well, again, I just read that Wikipedia article like yeah, you know, 40 hours ago, so it's on my mind. But it's always been my favorite. That anything related to you know, the, um, the derivative of itself, you know, that, that, that type of concept and um, exponential growth is really fascinating stuff um, if you dig down into it. So probably Euler's number. That's so a I, little e. I, I feel like, well, I mean, and sadly, there's no calendar date that really corresponds right. with that. I guess you could do it February 7th if you really wanted to, if you wanted to over round. Yeah. But I will ha we'll have you back maybe on Tau Day on uh, sure, sure. <laughs> June 28th. <laughs> Yeah, that, one, um, that one's not not quite as famous as pi or e, but but in some circles. <laughs> uh, so you clearly know a lot about math. I know you did your homework before you got started today, but I, I think of you first and foremost as a math guy, and I kind of do the same thing with Matt Evans, and that's why he was mm -hmm. on with us a couple of years ago for this too. What got you into engineering? I mean, was it the math that drew you in, or was it some other route? That's a good question. So what originally, the plan, the original plan, was um, my, my, uh, my, my family back in Connecticut ran a, um, a, a series of, uh, they would, they'd be really mad at me if I called them this, the mobile home parks. We called them manufactured housing communities. Um, and uh, the manufactured housing Because you know they're all going to watch this. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, they know exactly what I'm doing today. Um, the manufactured housing communities and um and uh, so that my original goal was to go get a civil engineering degree because they spent a lot of time interfacing with you know town civil engineering departments it's a lot of infrastructure all that kind of good stuff that's why i originally went to civil engineering school and uh about you know three quarters of the way through um that's right about when the last recession hit the last big one the 20 you know 2008 and uh, it became pretty clear that um, I was going to go back to school. That's what we all did at the time was just go go back to graduate school. And so of the of the of the uh, subsets of civil engineering, of the subdisciplines of civil engineering, the one that I that was easily the hardest was geotechnical engineering. And uh, and so I just I was like, that sounds great. Let's do that. Um, so actually, it probably wasn't the math. I, I actually would not categorize myself. Well, uh, compared, I work with a lot of applied mathematicians. And if you've ever worked with applied mathematicians, that those are math people. Um, they're, a, they're, they're a different breed. 
I, I'm, a, I'm an applied, applied mathematician. How about that? <laughs> um, I like, I like to use the stuff that they like to, you know, have already, have already taken, um, and, and, and simulate interesting things with it. But, uh, th- yeah, those, those, those are the real heroes. <laughs> So we got we got two more before I get into my pies here. Um, you gave a little shout out to a local peach pie there. Mm. Do you have a yeah. favorite regional pie? I mean, you mentioned the New York cheesecake, which is definitely a That's... regional thing. And then you mentioned the peach pie in Colorado. Is there is there one from either your youth or from your place now mm. that you love that you'd endorse? So yeah, I have a clearly have a lot of food opinions um first off the culinary scene in colorado is improving but it is not good yet we're getting there um a lot of transplants over the past 10 years the city of denver's increased quite a bit we're getting there but um so there's not that many local delicacies that are of particular import now where i grew up in connecticut connecticut's sandwich right between boston and massachusetts and in fact if you drew a line between the centers of both those cities and put a tick mark that's where i grew up um, so the influences are are from both cities, which means that um, from a pie perspective, it's all cheesecake or apple pie, obviously. Um, and that's what I that's what I'm always looking for when I'm uh, when I'm when I'm searching for those. So all of my culinary uh, desires almost always relate to, man, I wish I could go back to New York City or to Boston or to a little farm stand in New England and get something that I can't get here because the pizza here stinks. The bagels here stink. The pies here aren't that great. The cheesecake is particularly terrible. So it is interesting follow-up question here that I didn't intend on asking. You didn't mention pizza at all as part of this presentation. I, I had to I had to step away because if I got on the pizza train, we'll be here all day. <laughs> um, my favorite pizza in the world is of course Connecticut style pizza, which is sort of New York-ish. Um, for those of you who have never been to New Haven, Connecticut, I think it's the mecca of pizza in the world. I will stand by that. Um, it is fantastic stuff down there. Um, they do it the best. And the local pizza shop, I'll shout out Rosini's in my hometown of East Hampton, Connecticut, um, was number six on the best pizzas in Connecticut. And it is truly great. Very nice. The The final question I've got for you here before we maybe we start a little debate here is uh, people can't see it because the shot is cropped. Uh, but mm. you've got some you got a drum kit behind you. You got a ukulele up there on the wall. Um, do you have any math rock bands that you enjoy? Oh, um, I I don't I don't know. I never thought of that. Um, isn't wasn't there a uh, there was like a nerdy um like a nerdy version of like all those uh, famous uh, all the all the elements that I remember hearing once. Um, I don't think I have any favorite rock uh, math rock bands. Although ma- although music in general is in, is 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 very mathematical, and I think actually there's a lot of us who enjoy music, enjoy playing music, um, uh, you know, with the scientific background, um, because there is something about it that sort of is, I mean, it's all, it's all vibrations, it's all math. Um, and being able to, you know, express your love for two different things using one thing is, is, is kind of cool. Um, I don't pretend to be good at any of these things, by the way. I just, I just like them and they're here in my room. So when I'm on Zoom calls, I can, I can uh, play around <laughs> with my camera off. That's excellent. So we're going to go now. I've, I've got a few pies here because I didn't actually make a pie today. And I felt a little bit guilty about that. But we, we put together a little presentation here called oh, Pies nice. I Have Known. And we have a pie uh, symbol made of the digits of pie over there on the left. And so I just wanted to give a couple of shout outs here. Uh, the first one is for Saltanias. If people haven't had Bolivian food, you got to give it a shot. Saltanias are amazing. Um, it's, it's a mixed bag. Usually there's meat in there, but there doesn't always have to be a lot of vegetables, a very, very, very thick crust. And if you get a good authentic Sultania, you're going to have a fried egg on the top inside. And that is absolutely the way to go. And the number one place, as far as I'm concerned, is Luz Mila's in Falls Church, where I live. Can't beat that. It's right on Lee Highway. Go enjoy uh, Sultania or Six. Empanadas, can't go wrong with empanadas. Uh, you can get all kinds of different empanadas now. And I give a shout out here to Half Moon in Miami. They have like probably 40 locations around the Miami area. They have 
guava empanadas, which are amazing. They have a cowboy empanada that has like steak in it. It's it's absolutely incredible. Uh, definitely, if you're in the Miami area, you got to check out Half Moon. The West Cornwall Pasty Shop in the UK, oh, best pasties ever. I'm from Michigan, and so I know pasties. Those are good meat and potato pies, right? They originally come from southwestern England, Cornwall. The miners made them to take with them, so they had a lunch they could carry. Today, in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, you can still buy them on the side of the road. In the UK, you can get them everywhere. They're especially in train stations and places like that. They're a good, like, quick food to take with you, so definitely check them out. Cherry pie the finest cherries in the world come from northwestern Michigan. These are sour cherries, tart cherries. And uh, you got to go with a uh, cherry hut in Beulah. There's two locations, but the Beulah one is big. They make cherry aid, uh, uh, salads with cherries in it, burgers with cherries in it. Pretty much everything has cherries in it. And their pies are excellent, so you're going to want to do that. Check out Sleeping Bear, Dunes National Park while you're up there. That's worth a time. And then I got to give a shout out to Jollibee. Jollibee is like the Filipino McDonald's. Um, they have many of the same foods, including the pies that you know and love for dessert. But the Jollibee ones, they have peach mango. That's kind of their classic. They have ube, which is purple sweet potato. It's like whipped and with sugar. They have ube macapuno, which is like ube and, and uh, cream cheese, kind of. So many different great versions. And, you know, and there were so many I left out. Another great one from my home state of Michigan is uh, strawberry pie from Big Boy. Uh, everybody probably knew Big Boy from their youth. It still exists in uh, Michigan and LA and maybe a couple other places, but the strawberry pie is the finest. So I I don't know if you want to refute any of these things. No, I, I have a, a, just a couple of comments. Um, I mean, what a what a great list. I love the I love the empanadas. I've never actually had um, what was that? Brazil? It's, would you say it was Saltania, Brazilian food? Bolivian. Saltania, yeah. Bolivian, excuse me, Bolivian food. Um, I'm going to have to go seek some of that out. Um, those look fantastic. I love any, again, savory pies are probably my favorite pies. So um, I'm always looking for stuff like that. Um, good call on the cherry. You're right. See, that's that's why I came in at number 10 on my list. But the, the ones you're looking for are the ones that have a little acidity to them. They have to have some sourness or else it's too sweet. It's too sweet and I don't want it. It's too much. And tart um, cherries don't travel well. So um, right. gotta go to a lot source. of people have never had them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got to go to the source. Now, it's been a long time since I've been in Michigan, but um, I'll, next time I'm there, gonna I'll have, have to, to make uh, the trip. I'm going to have to find some. So and then and then for the math rock, I got to got to give a shout out to Rush, probably the best known, you know, they're probably prog rock more than math rock. But with their different time signatures and everything, yeah, yeah. I would classify them as math rock. And if you've never listened to Rush, you should absolutely go do that and start with, I'd say, Permanent Waves. That's probably my favorite Rush album. The other band that I would like is a Baltimore band from the early 2000s called Maginot Line. And they had all kinds of crazy times signatures and uh if you just like general like alternative rock from the 90s and 2000s you will probably enjoy Maginot Line they only had one album and an EP so I can't really recommend anything because there's only two things for you to choose from so go listen to those I, that's that's what I've got for Pi Day and my favorite mathematician is definitely Euler I love Euler <sighs> it's I mean it, you but, can't go wrong <laughs> and like you said, though, there was so much cross-pollination between mm -hmm. people who lived at the same time period. And you found that in other disciplines, too, like philosophy with Socrates mm -hmm. and Plato. I mean, these people were students of each other. And in, in Europe, especially in the 17th and 18th centuries, you went to salons and discussed your ideas. And that's how you kind of built up your following. And Doesn't that sound like fun, going to, going to a, the, um, a coffee shop in the 17th, 1700s? Oh, it was probably tea. And uh... – and just and just not having your uh, your headphones and your computer and just and just talking with random people, I think that'd be fun. <laughs> a little intense, maybe sometimes. But <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't, but, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if modern humans can handle it, but uh, <laughs> that's what they had to do, right? <laughs> so, Eric, this was fantastic. It far exceeded all my Pi Day explanation. Ex expectations and i love pi day so for our viewers if you liked what you saw and you're you're still here so you probably did again click like subscribe and get notifications 
And if you do that, we'll let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. And we do that. We, we alert you with love in our hearts. And stomach's full of pie on a day like today. So, Eric, thank you so much for doing this. I hope it thank was fun. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. Thank you so much for having me, Brad. And I'm, uh, and I'm, um, and I'm glad you liked it. I, I always wonder, you know, the people who watch this, I'm like, <laughs> I guess it's Hopefully enjoyable, not. but I'm always amazed that people take time out of their days for my crazy stuff like this. So thank you to all of our viewers for sticking with us today, and we hope you have a very happy Pi Day. Our next live stream is next Tuesday, and it's the second in a three-part series with McAfee talking about their Rockfall mitigation products and strategies. So you'll want to join us at 2 p.m. next Tuesday for that. Also next week, we will have a very exciting announcement about our next live stream series with Keller. And you will not want to miss that. I can guarantee it. So we hope to see everybody next week for another great live stream and enjoy your pie day, America. <laughs>